All right, good morning everybody and welcome to Blackwood Church of Christ this morning. Um, you are all in fine voice already for those of you at home. There's been a little bit of a sing-along this morning before church formally officially started. So these guys in here are fantastic. Um, so you'll hear that in a moment. But welcome to the church this morning and we trust that you um, are met by God again this morning in a fresh and new way through what James has prepared for us this morning. So we invite you to stand and sing with us our first song this morning, which is a hymn, Crown Him With Many Crowns. song Amazing Grace My Chains Are Gone
loving and gracious God, we thank you for the privilege of being able to be here this morning. We thank you that you love us no matter where we find ourselves, that whether it's been a good week, a struggled week, that you have been present with us. And we thank you that you love us unconditionally. Be with us now, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And don't forget Kids Zone. church foyer at Blackwood Church of Christ every Tuesday morning we have free scones and coffee um, and that's from 9 till 12 o'clock and um, we've been going for about six years now six and a half years so we started when I retired I was looking for something to do and Rob Stevenson was sitting here doing coffee and um, when I we started the cafe ministry Cafe Plus, and that was Graham Thomas that called it that. And then uh, Rob said to me, well, if you're gonna charge for your scones, I won't do the coffee. And I said, not a problem, we'll have free scones and coffee. So we did that until um, Rob wasn't with us. He was our barista all those years. And uh, then I was without one, so Craig helped, our minister, and Mitch Wheatcroft helped. And then Pam, who's a volunteer with Beacon, she said, I'll learn and I'll come. So Pam comes every Wednesday. And we've had young Mitchell uh, Slade helping out his learning as well. So it's been wonderful. And I couldn't do it without Gillian Rosman and Pam. They help tremendously. It's important to me because I see it as a ministry. I see it as a time when people can come together during the week and sit and talk and engage with each other and uh, there's some wonderful conversations. There's a group of men that come in, uh, Rick Williams' friends, there's five or six of them that sit up the end and they do their thing and others come and go, some come earlier and then leave and another group comes in. But uh, it's just a time where people can come in, relax and talk and get to know each other. I think the reason I do it is when I said before, when I first retired, I needed to find a ministry to do because I love people and I love talking with people and mixing with people. And I saw this as an opportunity to um, just converse and talk and serve people. So that's what I see as, as ministry, as well as preaching and serving. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we bow before you in humble adoration and worship. Although we called you Father, Mother would be equally appropriate as you encompass the very best of both Mother and Father. We know you are triune, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Yet when we try to understand your triune nature, we fail miserably. We see your creator nature in the world around us, and yet the more we understand of the magnitude of your creation, the more humbled we should be before you. We see in Jesus the love you have for your creation, and in him we understand in a more complete way your true nature. In him we have our salvation and a road map of how you desire us to live. And in the Holy Spirit we have someone who encourages, motivates and gives purpose to our lives. And yet in all of this, our understanding of your true nature is so imperfect, like trying to see the real beauty of our world through dark glasses. And yet when we are sensitive to your influence on our lives, we can comprehend the many subtle promptings 
that you give us to encourage, motivate and reassure us of your presence. As your people, we try to live Christ-like lives, to be Christ-like to those around us. Yet if we are honest with ourselves before you, we need to confess we, are so, we so often fail miserably. There are times when we do those things we don't want to and probably more often fail to do those things you want us to do. As guardians and carers of your world, we have failed miserably, exploiting its resources almost to the point of no return. Universally, we have been indifferent to the impact our uncompromising use of resources have been, particularly those that are harmful to the planet. Father, there has been much publicity in recent months about the use and abuse of women. Historically, man has treated female as a second-class citizen. And although today we espouse equality, in practice we see men exploiting and abusing women shamelessly. Our very democratic and legal systems do little to allow or encourage appropriate redress when these matters come to light. For those of us who are lucky enough to live in a well-to-do country where economy, economic situations allow us a comfortable lifestyle, we confess we take these privileges for granted and mostly give little consideration to the many less fortunate than ourselves. It is not only a globe, on a global scale we see such inequities, for we have many within our own country who live in poverty. Help us to recognise the need for all to live equitably and do what we can to give sacrificially to the less fortunate in our world. We see this lack of compassion in our political systems as well and so need to be vocal advocates for our politicians to commit more financial resources and aid to countries and people who have little. Our refugee and migration policies are very restrictive adding further trauma to the persecuted and marginalised. We need to be strong supporters on their behalf, advocating for more just policies in these areas. Father, in all these things, we need to confess our failure and humbly ask your forgiveness. However, it is not just your forgiveness we need. We need you to motivate us to act on your forgiveness to be a voice for the disadvantaged and to move forward empowered by your spirit to address these inequities. We have so much to be thankful for, for family and the loves we share, for young children and the overflowing love and trust they share with parents and grandparents, for friends who care and share with us, for this church and the caring relationships we share as part of your family and for your presence in our lives, giving understanding and direction for life. We ask for your continued blessing on our church and its leaders. We pray for continuing wisdom and understanding for James as he leads us, and for the elders and other leaders of our church as they continue to faithfully serve you. At this time we pause to individually name those that we know are sick, hurting, or struggling with life. As we bring them before you, help us understand the role we need to play to be part of your answer. Father, may your spirit be ever present amongst us leading us into closer relationships with you and each other. We are truly blessed to be followers of Jesus and as such, we need to be a blessing to those around us. As we move close to the Easter remembrance, we offer our thanks for Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. As our thoughts focus on his sacrifice at this time, may our lives grow deeper in our perception and understanding of his presence. This morning, as we come around his table, fill our hearts with gratitude and love. Thank you for the privilege of bowing before you. Touch us now with these words 
so these words become other than a one-way conversation. We offer this time and ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we prepare our hearts and minds for communion. My worth is not in what I own. We want to get the wrapping all done while uh, you are singing, but that's great. And those of you at home, if you've got something prepared, you can get that ready as well. You stand as we sing.
We come now to gather around the table in the Lord's Supper, so I encourage you to have the elements ready as we enter this time of communion. Have you ever stopped to wonder at the power of music, the way that it can speak to you in ways that you could never express in your own words? That moment when you are surrounded by the sound and the lyrics of a song, reaching in and touching your very soul, eliciting an unexpected emotional response. Last week, Mike shared the story of his moving experience at a Midnight Oil concert. These extraordinary moments bring to our minds the memories of people and events that have defined us, and they often catch us completely unawares. I often struggle to express in words how I am feeling, yet immersing myself in music seems to create a connection from God to my soul, an experience that does not need words, a moment when you can truly sense God's presence and acceptance of who you are as you are. This past year I have found more time to tune in to the healing properties of music. During the lockdown, I spent time playing some of my favourite hymns and worship songs. When I felt disconnected and at a loss, music lifted my spirits and gave me a real sense of God's presence. One song in particular that spoke to me is the one we just sang together. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in him, no other, my soul is satisfied in him alone. As we join in communion this morning, let us be open to those moments when God speaks to us unexpectedly, yet at exactly the right time, to tell us that we are loved and accepted as we are. Let's pray for this meal and the offering. Almighty God, you know us and what keeps us from you. Restore our relationship with you and each other and send your spirit to make this bread and wine for us the body and blood of Jesus. We also pray for our gifts and offering. What you have generously given, we offer back to you. Use it to further your kingdom. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, to look, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus, given for you, to preserve you and deliver you to eternal life, let us now take and eat in remembrance and thanksgiving. same way he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes the blood of our Lord Jesus given for you the new covenant and the forgiveness of sin let us now drink together in gratitude and hope
morning. This morning's reading is from 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 10 to 17. Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and my suffering, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Indeed, all who want to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. But wicked people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving others and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for that reading, um, Andrew. It's so good to see you all here, in particular if you are new with us at Blackwood, either here in person or uh, online. We are really glad that you could join us. We hope that you felt welcome. We hope that so far the service has been a blessing to you. If you don't know me, my name is James. I'm the minister here, uh, which is a privilege and a joy. Uh, that sounded sarcastic. I really do mean that. Um, maybe it didn't sound sarcastic. Maybe I'm looking... Ah. I want to start off by talking about a bit of a paradox that I think we're all relatively familiar with, and it's this, that it tends to be those people that you're closest to and know the best, that you love the most and are loved in return by the most, that can surprise you the most. That even if you've known someone for years or decades, something will come up, maybe every year, maybe every month, that surprises you, that you didn't know about them, that there's a greater depth you can go to, to your knowledge of this person or your relationship with them, And if that is true for those we love most, it is especially true for God. I mean, it is theoretically possible that you could understand all that there is to understand about your spouse, your friend, your parent, your sibling. I mean, those people are all finite creatures, but God is infinite. Now, you could spend as many years, decades, centuries as you like, and you still would not have plumbed the depths of God. There would still be more of God's love to experience, more about God to understand and know, more grace to receive. And I know if we're not doing super well, sometimes when we hear that, it sounds like a burden, it sounds overwhelming. But when we're firing on all cylinders and we're seeing clearly, it's actually a wondrous, glorious, great and true invitation. That no matter your age and stage, there's still more life to receive from God. There's still more joy to enter into. There's still more to, to grow that relationship to deepen. And that's exactly why at the moment we are looking in this very practical way of deepening that relationship and understanding more about God. And that's learning how to discern the voice of God speaking to us. We're at week four in a five-week series around that. But if you are tuning in for the first time, don't worry, it will still make sense as a standalone. And we're doing this, we're looking at this hearing God and learning how to respond to him because there will always be more for us to learn about God. There will be always be more for him to give to us. We will never get stale or boring with God. Before we dive in today, I invite you to pray with me. Our loving God, we thank you that this is true. We thank you that there is always more of you that we can learn about. That you always have more love, more grace, more joy for us. Please help us to step one little step further into that this morning. Speak to our hearts and our minds. Open them up to hear from you that we might be transformed. In your name we pray. Amen. Last week we looked at this notion of God's voice within us, God speaking to us from within. 
And we looked at the idea that we have all these different desires in our spirits. Maybe it's a desire to start a job or stop a job, to start a family, to uh, find a partner, all these different desires. And when we see that some of those desires are inspired, they come about from God and his good gifts, we can just find out which those desires are and seek after them as a way of discerning God's voice. It is as if God is within us. Through our desires, we can find God's voice to us from within. And this morning, we look at the fact that it's not just within us that God speaks to us, but he also speaks to us from without as well. He speaks to us as if a voice speaking to us from beyond, not just from within our spirits. And there's a couple of different types of ways in which God does this. The first is that God can speak in ways that are explicit and obvious signs and wonders you know god speaks to people through audible voices through visions and dreams through answers to prayer that are like impossible coincidences providing signs about something that god might be saying through others speaking to us or angelic messengers speaking as well these are all these overt and obvious and explicit ways that god speaks we see this constantly throughout the Bible. If you are looking for it, you'll be amazed about how frequent it is. Just look at the Christmas story, the story of Jesus' birth. It starts off with an angelic visitor coming to Mary, telling her that she would carry the Messiah, the uh, Savior of the world. Here is an angelic messenger that God is speaking to. Then when Mary goes to tell her fiance, Joseph, I'm pregnant and the baby's God, and Joseph's response is, yeah, Mary. <laughs> um, okay, we'll do this quietly. <laughs> I think we know where the baby's really from. And he gets ready to break off the engagement quietly behind the scenes. He is convinced not to by another angel coming to him in a dream. And there must have been something about that dream that was so impactful that when he heard within it, don't worry, she's actually telling the truth, he was willing to risk the massive social shame to go ahead with the engagement and the marriage, confident that this child really was from God. Then when Jesus is born and they take him to the temple to be dedicated to prophets, they are called in the Gospel of Luke, come and tell Mary and Joseph that it is true that this is the Saviour. He will cause the salvation, the redemption of many. Here is God speaking through another voice. And then when Jesus is ready to start his ministry, he is baptized. And when he comes out of the water, an audible voice from the heavens. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Just right in the first few chapters of the New Testament, we have audible voices, dreams, people, God speaking through people, all of these sort of explicit ways that this happens. Unless we think that this is just some sort of super spiritual class of people in the Bible for whom this happens, we know that it happens in contemporary life for followers of Jesus as well. I myself have, have never had God speak to me in this way, but I have people close to me for whom I trust immensely who have had this sort of thing happen to them. I know of someone who was in ministry in one particular church and they were really enjoying it. The location was great, the church was great, and they were happy. They received, however, a call from a different church to come over and join them. And even though they were happy where they were, there was something about this call they couldn't quite ignore. And so they said to God in prayer, fine, if you want me to go on this, you've got to give me a sign. In the whole time we've been in ministry in this location, I've never been able to take the kids to that tourist attraction a couple of suburbs over. If you want me to go, make it happen. Within a week, someone from the church arrived and said, I've got tickets to go to this particular attraction, but I can't make it anymore. Do you and your family want them? There was that obvious sign. I know people who have had such profound dreams that have impacted them so strongly that they are left in no doubt that it is from God. I know someone who was walking along one day and literally heard an audible voice saying, you were going to work there one day as I looked at this particular organization. They did nothing about it, told no one. Three years later, they get a call from that organization asking them 
to come and join them. There's all of these different stories, and I'm sure you would have some too, that if we asked around, we would find some within this church. This is one of the types of ways in which God speaks to us from without, the explicit, the signs and wonders, the obvious. And a lot of the time, for most of us, we would really, really like for God to speak to us in this way. I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, there was a a point in my life where I was a bit angry with God, a bit disappointed with God. Things weren't going as I thought they should. And so I asked God for a sign. Just do this, just do that, to let me know that I would know for sure that you were there, that you love me, that I'm on the right path, I'm doing the right thing. You might have had a similar experience to that, this feeling within you that if only you could get something obvious and explicit, that your faith would be strengthened, that you would know what the right thing to do would be, that you would be confident and sure. We've all had this experience, this longing for this type of communication from God. Well, if we're going to continue, I think it's important to point out, while God does communicate in this way, and it's good when he does, these signs actually have a far more limited good than you realise for bringing about faith and giving us direction. In making this uh, point in his great book, Hearing God, Dallas Willard tells a story of the wife of an Episcopalian priest named Agnes Sanford. Agnes had a young child who had an earache that went on for six weeks. And as a parent, tell you what, that would have been something else. And this child was in great distress and the whole family was in great distress. And so she prayed and prayed and prayed that this child would be healed. And for six weeks, absolutely nothing. Felt like dead silence from God. And then one day, a neighbouring priest was travelling through someone who knew her husband. And he came along and he saw the sick child and he said, oh, would you mind if I prayed? And she said, yeah, sure, give it a go. He said a very quick, clear, Lord, please help heal this child. And immediately, the child's fever went away. He closed his eyes, rolled over, fell asleep and was completely fine. And you would think this, a healing in response to a prayer would have welled up within Agnes a great faith and a great confidence in God. But actually, at this time, it for her was the exact opposite. It just made her confused. Why God did his prayer work when my prayers didn't? Why God did his prayers work this time, but I know when he prayed for this other person last week, that didn't come about. How does any of this work? We would think that signs like this would automatically grow our faith without question, but they actually have limited capacity to do that. They have limited capacity to give us direction as well. Like, for example, if you were tossing up between jobs and you actually literally heard an audible voice, go for this job, you'd probably know to go for that job in that moment, but it would be zero help for you to know how long to stay in that job or what to do when you are there, or whether you should stick at it when the going gets tough. If you're tossing up the idea of starting to volunteer with a mission organisation, and you had someone come up to you and say, I know this is crazy, I don't know if I'm saying the right thing, but I feel God telling me to tell you that you need to join this mission organisation, you'd probably get a bit of a buzz at first, be really excited about it, but I can guarantee that just after 24 hours, you'd begin to doubt it. I'd be guaranteed that just a day in, you would begin to wonder whether it was really the right thing. That overt sign for God doesn't automatically give you the courage to follow through. They also don't grow our faith as much as we think that they might. If I can give you an example that kind of shows this, imagine if you had a teenage child and the deal was they've learned how to drive, they're heading out at night, that they had to ring you every half an hour to let you know that they're okay. That's realistic, isn't it? Teenagers would do that. (laughs) Now, you would feel better every time the phone rang and you picked it up and they said, still okay, mum, still okay, dad. But you wouldn't be growing in your trust of them, would you? In fact, if anything, you'd be trusting them less. And the second they didn't call on the half hour, the second it got to 40 minutes, 50 minutes, you'd probably be a nervous wreck on the floor. In the same way, If God just gave sign after sign after sign, it wouldn't actually be growing our faith. If anything, 
It would be doing the opposite. And the second you asked for a sign and it didn't come, what was left of your faith would probably evaporate relatively quickly. These overt ways of God speaking to us, they have a far more limited good than we realise for bringing about faith and giving us direction. They look great at first, but they don't deliver as much as they promise. It is exactly why God's preference for communicating to us isn't with this type of communication. Now, God's preference, his number one go-to, his ideal for speaking to us from beyond isn't this. It's something more subtle, something more natural, something more humble, something more intimate. It's his still, small voice. His spirit lovingly, kindly communicating with our spirit. You probably aren't aware of it, you haven't been able to give it a name, but I'm confident you would have heard of this still, small voice. It's what happens when we're praying or reading the Bible or in worship or just have this moment of encounter with God in our day-to-day lives and suddenly a thought or an image or an idea or a sense appears in our hearts and minds that comes from somewhere else. It's, you know, when you're reading the Bible and a phrase just leaps off the page at you. You know, I will complete the good work that I began in you. I will carry it on to completion. Or sell what you have and give it to the poor. Or uh, greater love have no man than this to lay down his life for the sake of his friends. And the word just leaps out at you like nothing else on the page did for some reason. And immediately pops into your mind some sort of application or meaning for your own life. This still small voice is what happens when you're praying and bidden from nowhere comes, give Janice a call or maybe take Wednesday night off or you are loved. Or what happens when you're walking along, not expecting anything and you just have this moment of clarity like the lights are turned on, you see someone across the room and the thought appears in your mind. Go ask them how they are doing. This is God's still, small voice communicating with us. There's something really hard to define about any form of communication, hard to explain. Like, how does it work that from my brain to my mouth, to the sound waves, to your ear, to your brain, how does that work? Don't think about it too much, how you're comprehending what I'm saying right now, because you'll probably go crazy. And so we shouldn't be surprised that there's also something mysterious about this spiritual communication, that this is what it feels like when spirit communicates with spirit. And it is God's preference for his way of talking to us. It is good, these signs and wonders, at giving an initial burst of faith. But learning how to hear the still small voice matures faith. It deepens faith. It teaches us how to trust that God loves us and is for us and is with us, even when there isn't some overt, big, over-the-top sign. A cool sign is great for maybe giving us a little bit of direction at first, but it's the still small voice that teaches us how to learn to make God-shaped decisions for ourselves, how to learn to grow into the maturity that God wants to, rather than just having to come to him for every little decision all the time. This is God's preference. It is why this is the only way that he spoke with Jesus. Whenever there was an audible voice or some sort of sign around him, Jesus made it clear that this wasn't for him, but for the other people around God's preference is to speak to us through this still, small voice. And so there is nothing more important for us to learn how to discern the voice of God than to learn how to recognize which of these thoughts, images, words, senses, whatever they are that pop into our minds are from God and which one's from us and which ones are from something else. Ultimately, this is about intuition. We've really learned how to communicate with God when we can do this intuitively, just know which ones are from him and enter into this sort of what Dallas Willard or Brother Lawrence would call this ongoing conversation with him. But as we learn how to do this, there are a few questions that might help you, a few questions that might help you to understand which of these thoughts are from God and which ones aren't. Firstly, you can ask yourself, when did the thought happen? If it came about when you were angry and hungry and tired, it might not necessarily be from God. If it came about when you were praying, reading the Bible, or in worship, or have this moment of clarity, 
That's a sign that that thought could be from God. The second question you can ask yourself is, did it follow my train of thought? If the thought that popped in was a natural progression of what you're thinking about already, then it might be from you. However, if it comes in unbidden, something that you weren't thinking about at all or hadn't thought about in a long time, could be a sign that that is from God. The third one, was this thought something that I needed to hear but didn't want to hear? Now, a little secret, you might know this already, we as human beings are really bad at telling ourselves things that we need to hear but don't want to hear. We are excellent at telling ourselves things that we want to hear. So if it's something you needed but didn't want, could be a sign that it is from God. Fourth, what is the content of the thought? Something from God will never contradict the Bible and it usually won't go against the wisdom of the followers of Jesus throughout the ages. Something from God will lead you into greater Christ-likeness, greater humility. It will conform, fit well within the world of the Bible. Finally, perhaps the most important and the most difficult to define, what does the thought feel like? Thoughts that have this anxiety or shame or worry around them, this darkness, this confusion, rarely from God. Thoughts from God have a lightness, but a significance, a goodness, a joy even with conviction behind them. As we learn to discern the still small voice, those are some things that might help. When did it happen? Did it follow the train of thought? Did I need to hear it but didn't want to hear it? What was the content and how did it feel? And if you are very interested in seeing those written down, they'll be online on the website in the sermon notes later. As we ask those questions, it not, might not necessarily tick all the boxes, but the more it positive things come from those questions, the more likely it could be from God. Uh, four days ago, I was having a conversation with someone about this sermon. They were asking me what I was preaching on at the time, what's coming up. And I said, we're preaching on the idea of discerning the voice of God. And I'm really passionate about the idea of making it as practical and tangible as it is. Like I was always frustrated as a Christian growing up with people saying, God said to me and me going, what on earth do you mean by that? I wanted to try and make it as tangible as possible. And do you know what my friend who I was talking to said, if you can believe it? He said, oh, so what's God been saying to you recently? He had the audacity to ask me to practice what I was preaching. (laughs) Once I recovered from my initial shock and slight embarrassment at not having something quite ready uh, to go... I did remember this time that I was confident that God was saying to me, you've done everything you can now, now you need to stop stressing about how stressful life is and come to trust me. It happened uh, as I was uh, praying on, to get ready for the week on a Tuesday morning that this thought popped into my mind. And as I was reflecting back, intuitively I thought that this could be God speaking to me, but as I reflected back on it, wondering how did I know that, I went through all these questions. When did it happen? It came in a time of prayer. Uh, Did it follow my train of thought? No, not at all. I was actually coming before God asking, what do you want me to do? How can I serve you? What do I need to do to be good? And this thought popped into my head. Was it something that I needed to hear but didn't want to hear? Absolutely. I would have much preferred God to say, oh, by the way, James, I'm about to get rid of all the stress in your life. It's going to be great. What was the content of it? Well, it sounded very biblical to me. A, your will be done, not mine. And how did it feel? Even though it wasn't exactly what I wanted to hear, there was this lightness to it, this just rightness, this sense of God speaking to me. I think there's a couple of reasons why we might be hesitant to discern the still, small voice of God. One of them could be philosophical, as in some of us might think that all that exists is the physical world and everything else, when we think we've heard something, we're just making it up. I won't go into it now because it would be another hour to the sermon, but I just don't think that's the way the world works for philosophical reasons. The spiritual world is real and even primary. The other reason why we might be hesitant to discern this still small voice is fear that we could get it wrong. 
fear that we think something is from God and we say to ourselves or others that it's from God, but really it was just our own thoughts or our own desires projected onto God. Well, I want to reassure you if you're going to go ahead and learn to discern this voice, if you're afraid that at times you might get it wrong, I will assure you that you will absolutely get it wrong at times. That there will be times that you think it's from God, but really it's just your own projection. It's why it is important to go about this with humility, to check with others, to be willing to say things like, even just to yourself, I think God is saying, or I have a sense that God is saying something to me. There's no extra prizes for sounding really confident when you're not. There is this chance we will get it wrong, and I understand the fear that we'll get it wrong. But just because there is a chance we will get it wrong doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. If you want to live ethically, if you want to do the right thing in life, there is a chance you will get it wrong. There is a chance in trying to do the good thing you actually accidentally end up doing the wrong thing and hurt someone. And yet you have to try and live ethically. If you want to be a good, engaged parent, there is more than a chance that some of your engaged, active parenting will damage your children. And yet, you have to be an active and engaged parent. Just because there is a chance we could get this wrong doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. There is so much at stake in our hearing God in terms of our intimacy with him, in terms of the work he has for us to do in this world that so desperately needs a people ready not just to go along with the flow, not just to focus on their own comfort, not just to run the rat race, but to hear that still, small voice that directs them towards serving others, towards acts of love and goodness, sharing the good news as well. As we conclude, quickly, if you want a practical framework for having a go at this discerning the still, small voice of God... It's four steps, which you should know if you've been around the last couple of weeks. Preparation, observe, interpret, and respond. First of all, it is important to lay the foundations. Nothing will help you more about discerning the still small voice of God than reading the Bible frequently and praying and worshipping frequently. Taking time to examine your own hearts before God. What are your strongly held beliefs and desires and fears and shame that might either stop you from hearing God or distort what you've heard? Then as preparation, just ask God, God, please speak to me. Then as you go on in your times of prayer or Bible or day-to-day -day life, observe what are these thoughts that pop into your mind, your images, these senses. Then interpret, ask God to help make clear which ones are from him, which ones are from you, which ones are from something else. Work with a friend on this. Ask for support. Check with the Bible, all these things. And then finally, respond to it. Because you haven't really fully heard until you've responded. We proclaim that God is our friend. That God loves us. That we can relate to God. But what sort of a relationship is it if there's no communication? <laughs> Maybe we've been waiting for some big obvious hairy sign to know that God is speaking to us whereas in reality all along God had been speaking to us in a more humble intimate fashion in his still small voice he'd been calling us forward into greater love into greater maturity into greater faith if we only have ears to hear it will you pray with me a loving God we thank you that you do speak to us. We thank you that there are times that you speak through signs and wonders and audible words and visions and people communicating to us, and, and we do thank you for that. We recognise that as good and great for us. But we also thank you that you major on what is more important, what is more good, your still small voice. Please give us the courage to listen. Please help us to recognise which of those thoughts, images, whatever they are, are from you, and to learn how to converse to you in response. In your name we pray. Amen.
As I mentioned, there are, if you want to follow this up, look into this further, there are resources. You can head onto our website and check out the page dedicated to the series. There will be sermon notes. You're welcome to check out Dallas Willard's Hearing God as well. We have a couple of copies here that can be borrowed. Next week we're concluding and one of the things we'll be looking at is, so what happens when you try to hear God and you can't? So if that's a question on your heart, make sure you look into that. And finally as well, before I hand over to the singers, we have, as we've had the last few weeks, out by the offering, a little kind of homework guide guide, if you want to give this a go. We will stand as we sing in response to words that we've just heard. The grace is mine. seat thank you as always we invite you to respond to anything that might have been stirring with you in the service a, a thought a feeling an image anything that came to mind you know if it is uh, if it is it feels good it feels consonant with what god would speak to you then go ahead and act on it one way you can respond is filling out a connect card in front of you uh, as a way maybe you want a prayer request you want to catch up with someone you can do it that way. And of course, online we have our digital welcome card. We love, love, love to hear from you guys through there. Even if you just want to jot down your name to let us know that you were with us today, uh, that would be great. Next week, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. That is right. We are only two weeks out from Easter, if you can believe it. And Palm Sunday, another great Sunday in the church year. Uh, kids will uh, have something for us. It'll also be great for kids. So in particular, if you have any children, grandchildren, anything like that, that would like to come along, they are very welcome to. I don't think we have a slide for this, but after that Palm Sunday service will be our, uh, the Sunday roast. Unfortunately, already at capacity, but they do have a, a slightly reduced number this month to get used to the COVID restrictions. So keep an eye out for that in coming months 
uh, there will be more places. We don't want you to feel like you'll never get back in. Uh, keep an eye out for that. Then, of course, we're heading into Holy Week after Palm Sunday. Easter, uh, Good Friday is our service here at 9 a.m. It's a contemplative, a reflective service. I, I'm really looking forward to it, and I hope you'll be able to share that with us as well, either here in person or online. Everyone is welcome to come along. Then on Easter Sunday itself, our usual 10 a.m. Uh, starting time, we can confirm, I'm very excited about this, that our choir is going ahead and there will be a practice for that choir after the service next week and then before the service on Easter Sunday. And by the way, if you had spoken to me and you seemed even half interested in doing it, I wrote your name down, so you're coming along. <laughs> Thank you very much. We now, of course, have our time of coffee and tea. We're able to do uh, that again. If you, um, most of you would have uh, signed up beforehand, put your order in beforehand. We really appreciate that. That makes it possible to do tea and coffee in this uh, COVID-safe environment. However, if you've forgotten, there's only a couple of you, the barista today is as beautiful as she is kind. Um, so you can probably uh, uh, go out there and quickly jot down something. It's my wife. I'm not being creepy. Now, for our benediction as we conclude our service with a blessing from God. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Amen.